Hello everyone, welcome to Blue Abroad, it's the Jumper Punch. I'm the Pom, as we know, we've got Rocco to the right of me. Guys, how are we going? And we have sports superstar, entertainer, teacher, extraordinaire Glenn Manton to the left of me. Wow, hell of an introduction. It's, it's what we're known for. It's what you're known for. Yeah, yeah, it it is. Is. Give me three things that you know. Me personally, yes, I will it's not you personally. Um, it's not probably huge coals. Is huge coals. I mean, big bold statements. I thought you said coals. Uh, it's like some sort of supermarket. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Entrepreneur. <laughs> yes. Coals. No, huge no. coals. Yeah. Um, I'm probably very bipolar on this show. I'm one minute happy, one minute depressed. And. Uh, Good banter. Good banter. banter. Yeah, I like it. Um, three, three points. About, about, about the show. Oh, about me about personally. You. I need about to me know who personally. Who am I talking to? Who am I talking to? Well, I, I introduce myself as a, as a father. Um, yeah. Of how many children? Two children. Boy and girl. Boy and girl. Taylor. Dylan Taylor's yeah. twenty-three. Dylan's fourteen. Big fans. And um, yeah, big fans so. of me. Big fans of me. Big fans of me, and um, the one thing everyone always uh, talks about me is I'm a train driver. That seems to be the most interesting thing about my life, apparently. Okay. And right, and the other thing I would be would be just uh, just a go getter. In the last five or six years, this is where it's brought me to this point here. I've done the George Costanza. You ever watched Seinfeld? I've watched. Remember when he just did the did the opposite of everything? That's like, what you've been doing. Last time. Saying yes to everything. Saying yes to everything and saying no to things I normally say yes. And wow. I'm here now talking to you. Wow. How's that go? No, that's a high point. <laughs> We're about to find out, aren't we? Good. So run me through this. What What's the viewer and the expected guest here to, to really take away from this? We've got a, a half an hour, an hour, two hours, six hours. Well, how long are we going to chat for? Well, usually it goes 30 minutes to an hour, and what we try and do is we try and humanise the footballer. I think that oh, footballers nice. are very caricatures of people. Nice idea. Yeah. We, we kind of get the impression that all we do is play football, and after that, there is nothing else about you, and you, you can kind of bring you out on a Saturday, keep the footy, and then lock you away, and wait till yeah. next weekend. So we try and get the mindset, and particularly you with what you do off the field and since retirement, I think it would be really interesting to find out the mentality of a footballer and what you feel as a footballer throughout your stages. Let's do it. Let's do it. Let's just try to bring it all closer together. The fans, the footballer, the person, make it all one. I like it. Well, how about this? How about this? Here, the shallow end. Here is the deep end. Yeah. Step in. Oh, we'll, go the, we'll, go, we'll go straight, we'll start, baby pool, baby pool, and yeah, we'll we, finish, yeah, yeah, we're gonna finish we'll, strong. we'll finish with the Sharks, right. I think. So obviously we know you started at our arch rivals, Essendon Football Club, the under-19s. I did. So I'd love to know, what is the mindset, the pressures of a young aspiring footballer? Did you ever feel like the pressures to succeed? Was there any doubts that crept into your mind? How did you deal with them as a, as a young man? So it's an interesting question to start with because now at the age of 47, you're going to reflect on that time from a number of different perspectives. And the thing that instantly springs to mind with my junior career and in fact how my career played out is a time where I was asked, and every one of your viewers would be familiar with this, to fill in a player profile sheet. Now, this was part of the... The very, very archaic uh, protocol that went with playing for Victoria as part of the Teal Cup squad. The reason I reference this, and Anthony Kudafidis, who obviously you would know and love as Carlton supporters and through this particular channel, can vouch for this occurrence, uh, let alone the fact that I could pull out this piece of paper from my archives at home. But as you worked your way down this profile piece, Name, age, date of birth, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera, all those sorts of things. There was a section for music. Might have been titled from memory. What music are you interested in? A space two centimeters by two centimeters. I filled that space and I filled the entire 
back of the page with bands that I was listening to, music that I was interested in, and these were artists and genres and, for that matter, experimental spaces that no one else in football was listening to this stuff at all. And I, I thought nothing of it. In fact, I was quite proud when I'd finished my work to hand it in. <laughs> but now I, I remember uh, the looks on coaches' faces and so forth saying, you know, the Buzzcocks, the Dead Kennedys, you know, these sorts of, the dead milkmen, what the hell is this stuff? And again, it's not until you get a little bit older that you realise that who I was, or in fact am as a person, was always a square peg in a round hole. And I've never been prepared to knock the edges off for the sake of conforming to what I see as a very narrow, uh, shallow way of looking at not only life, but the individuals within it. So to sort of circle back to your question, I never had any doubt within myself as to who I was and what I was capable of doing, whether it's in arts or sports or in literature, whatever it happened to be. And that's not to say that I thought I was going to be the greatest in any of those fields. I just knew that I could be myself. But it wasn't until I started to immerse myself or, in fact, be immersed in football culture or sports culture, because it's broader than just AFL football, that I realised not everyone's thinking this way and not everyone's going to be accepting of this thinking. and Not everyone's going to be inquisitive enough to say, right, quite seriously, the dead milkman, it's interesting, this kid, I put him up against 25 other kids, he's the only person listening to this, that's really interesting rather than be punitive or be negative or dismissive, I'd like to learn what it is about this music or this particular genre or band or individuals within that space that he is attracted to because I'd like to see more of him as a person here. So that's a very mature way of thinking, which I think in in a broader sense, again, sports and, and particular AFL football can be quite immature and dismissive of people who don't fit into the cookie cutter mold but I never was that person. I was never the sort of person who you could rubber stamp and say, right, yep, yeah, he's among the rest of them. So you say like you you never were, never was that person, but when? When did you believe you're that person that you were never going to fit into the mould? I mean, there would have had to be the time when you were younger when, because you would have always been that kind of person, but did you feel out of place and thinking, man, I don't fit in here, this isn't right, and then you got to a stage where you go, you know what, this is who I am and this is how I'm going to succeed. When was that? For me, yep. it, I would spend a lot of time in Fitzroy and ironically in Napier Street. I say ironically because I grew up in Napier Street, Strathmore, so Napier Street, Strathmore is the same street that Windy Hill yep. was built upon. So I grew up as probably one of the most local footballers in the history of football. Mm-hmm. But my aunt actually owned a house on Napier Street, Fitzroy, which, again, back in the 80s, 90s, wasn't the uh, gentrified space that we see now uh, that was, you know, this, in those days, it was not inclusive. It was a very, very rough and tough sort of space. Now, my aunt happens to be one of the most learned people you'd ever meet, still basically lecturing at uni and um, you know, a choir of that many degrees, it's not funny. You only talk to her about the Simpsons, one of those sorts of people. <laughs> but I went to a family gathering at her house as a 12-year-old, and at that particular party, it was the only time I ever saw both of my parents drunk. It was the only time in my life that I've seen both of my parents drunk. And there was no nothing untoward about the party or the space, but as a 12-year-old, I was quite bored by the atmosphere and, and the space. So I snuck off into my aunt's house, my uncle as well, since the past, and I came across their library. Now their library was roughly the space of this room, for those people wondering, we're in the Kindred Studios in Yarraville, western suburbs of Melbourne, uh, and this, this room is a reflection of their library. Now this was a library that was literally spewing books for on the floor everywhere, just books, books, books. And I started flicking through these books as a 12-year-old, books around sexuality, books around agriculture, books around design, books around whatever it may be, all sorts of books. And I quickly realised that 
the things that I was into mightn't be what other people are into. The things that I saw as boundaries, other people might see as starting spots. The things that I was attracted to, other people might be repulsed by. So as a 12-year-old, it just galvanised this understanding that I'm never going to be for everyone. Yeah. I'm never going to fit in everywhere. I'm never going to understand what's happening in someone else's head unless I have a conversation, unless I ask and vice versa. So it was a really enlightening experience that allowed me to say, the best I can do is be me. I'm just going to focus on being me and learning to be a better me. And quite truthfully, I'm sure our viewers would agree with this, I have some really bad days. <laughs> I have some days where I make some terrible mistakes, say some things that aren't uh, I guess, kosher, I do some things that aren't appropriate, I get it wrong. But on a broader scale, if you will, I feel like I get more right than I get wrong. So I've just always worked, I guess, on that ratio of waking up every day, being comfortable with who I am, even though that might be uncomfortable, and just doing my best to live my life and knowing that other people are out there struggling at potentially a, a much greater rate than I am. And I have to be aware of that. And at the end of the day, as someone once told me wisely, you're never going to be the system. So this idea that I would come in, for example, AFL podcast, uh, and, and turn the AFL on its head. Everyone must now listen to the dead milkman or whatever it may be. <laughs> that's it. Well, that's ridiculous. Yeah. That's not going to work. Yeah. But what is going to work is enjoying the space, the camaraderie, the self, uh, what would you say, awareness development that comes with it and make a focus of just being a better you. And I do hate saying things like that because it sounds so trite, but that's the best you can do, unless you can tell me otherwise. No, no, I think it's spot on. And we know throughout your career that the Kookaburra, I listened to this story on the way here again, I find it absolutely fascinating how we met him. And I love something that you said um, at the end of this TED Talk that I was listening to about if fate hits you to take it. And I think sport is very fate. You hear a lot of players when they say, how did you get into the system? You get the very mundane stories of, you know, my dad sent me to football camp and I became a footballer. I find that was a big turning point in your career because obviously you went on to be a premiership winner, which is, I would say, just speaking to you now, that's probably not the pinnacle of your life. And I think that's beautiful because there'll be a load of young kids watching this and that is their pinnacle. I think the big thing for you was, and I think the cooker may have taught you this, I might be wrong, but it was owning yourself and being the best version of yourself. And I think you've done something remarkable as a footballer. At the end of your career, I think you've become a true hero. I think the football is minuscule because you are helping people find that mentor. And whether that's in yourself or in themselves, more importantly. So tell us how important mentorship is, not just in the football, but also in self-development to you. Look, you've almost answered your question uh, with a comment, which it's a very intelligent comment, a learned comment. You have to be able to mentor yourself. So I'm not sure when this will go to air. Two days from now, tonight. Yeah, probably two days. Two, yeah. two or three days. Yeah. Yeah. So today is Wednesday the 20th. 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 Thank you. It's fresh enough. Yeah. There you go. Yeah. So on Monday the 18th, no one knows this. The only person on the planet who knows this is me. But on Monday the 18th, I got out of bed and went about my business and some things I do in the morning, part of a routine. And I looked back on my bed and I said to myself, it's just not good enough. That cannot be the best you can do with the way in which you leave your bed for the day. Yeah. So you need to refocus as to how you present your bed, your personal space to sleep in for when you return later in the day. And so yesterday morning, being Tuesday, this morning being Wednesday, there was a really strong uh, focus in my mind to make sure my bed was left in an appropriate space. Very good. So Alec Eppers, uh, my friends and family, both of you, no one else can take responsibility for that. I have to be able to take responsibility for that. 
and there might be people out there who are listening to this and saying, well, what a load of fucking shit that is. If I return to a bed that's a pig site, or a kitchen, or my debts, or a relationship, or the way I treat my body, whatever it may be, what am I setting myself up for in terms of the next step in the day? And that's not to say that I've left it at some military grade levels. That's not what I'm interested in. I'm not looking to bounce a coin off the sheets. But I'm looking to put forward an example of my person that I'm comfortable with and I think serves the integrity of who I am well. So to come back to your point, I need to be able to discipline and mentor myself first. And the way in which I'll do that is via observation, via discussion, by questioning as part of that discussion, by reflection. And again, anyone listening to this may think, is when religious? No, I'm not religious. Is he part of some sort of alternative cult? No, I'm not part of some sort of alternative cult. Now, I guess these are the sorts of boring stereotypes that have plagued me throughout my career that Glenn is some sort of wild and off, off the wall thinker. I don't think so at all. I've just had an ability from a young age to be inquisitive, to be interested in brackets, to ask questions, and as I said, to observe carefully, and not to dismiss, and again, coming back to your point about opportunity, not to dismiss opportunity. And I think, and, and again, Rocco, you touched on this with your attitude over the last five or six years, to say yes to everything, and you actually corrected me, which was, I think, spot on, is a mistake. You can't say yes to everything. That was your own. ridiculous. But to consider everything, yes. to think carefully about it. What, what am I going to do here? How am I going to play this out? What's right for me? What's right for the situation? What's right for the other people involved? What will I gain here? What will I lose? And not in a monetary side of things, but just what could I potentially gain here whilst losing? Right, I'm, I'm going to feel very uncomfortable in this situation. I'm not going to have my phone on me. I don't like the music. I don't know the crowd. So I'm losing in all these situations. But if I step out of that, maybe I'll start winning a little bit too. As I meet someone new, I discover something different about the world around me and the people within it. And um, without taking too big a step away from your question, I think this is where sports, and in particular AFL football, get it very, very wrong. They just stay in that one channel, that one space, and they don't explore these other areas at the risk of failing or at the risk of losing a bit of time. Yeah. There's nothing wrong with looking over the fence and, and seeing what's there. Yeah. It's, a, it's a great answer to the question. I think there was a long answer to a question. I love it. I love it. No, I love it. And that's the aim of the show. It's to yeah. try and step outside and see the footballer is a human who happens to have a job that we get to watch. We don't have the luxury of seeing our doctor in the surgery looking after the person before us and after us. We just made that impression of him when we're in the room. I think it's important as fans to know that you guys are real people. You, you cry, you laugh, you joke and you also make mistakes and i think Constantly. my next question is around that social media you said it yourself people think alternative cult be quick to make an uneducated statement with very little repercussions and i think footballers particularly now have that horrible thing that they go out and have a drink and they're chastised by all their fans even though probably every person who is commenting on that instagram post went out for a beer the same night now, for you, how do you think is a good method for players to cope with that external pressures from, I think, the media? I think the media focus on the wrong thing and not, come on, everyone, we've all done this, we've all had a beer and got in late. How would you advise a young footballer to deal with them social pressures? About three kilometres from where we're sitting is the Yarraville Cold. And I've tried, probably like most people, to navigate Colds very carefully over the last 12 months. It's not somewhere that I like to visit very often. In fact, shout out to the Happy Apple where I usually shop. But I went to the Arabville Coles recently and as I was walking through the car park, there were four or five young kids, 10, 11 tops, on their bikes. And they were like the BMX bandits. And they flew through the car park yelling and screaming and counting on my pork chops. And we're talking about babies here. And I laughed at them because it was school holidays, or it still is school holidays, 
they're on their bikes, they're having fun, and they're talking smack. Just for one another, just nonsense stuff about anything and everything at the top of their voices. They uh, park their bikes, chain their bikes up, and then they literally rush into coals like a swarm. And they're yelling and screaming and so excited, and they're going to go to the lolly aisle, and they're going to get this drink, and they're going to do this, and everything's at the top of their voice, jack this and build this and blah, blah, blah. And sure enough, within 20 seconds, someone yelled at them, screamed at them, shut up, can't act that way. And I couldn't find the right moment on that occasion to potentially pull them aside. If I knew how it would play out, I would have pulled them aside before they went into the coals and just said, gentlemen, this is the way you should play this out. Yeah. Because there's going to be a whole heap of people in there who want to nail you. I don't see anything wrong with your behaviour, except for being over exuberant. And I'd rather you're over exuberant and I can pull you down and try and build mm -hmm. you up. So I find that, again, in sports, there isn't a lot of that templating for young athletes to really understand how to step out and enjoy themselves socially. And a bit like the example that I give, if those young men were taught, okay, look, we can carry on here, but when we step into this space, there's a few oldies here and a few people here that we need to just turn it down a little bit here. So again, you've got a young athlete, hey, if you want to go out on a Friday night, here are your five choices. You know what? This one's going to be probably the quietest with a crowd that's probably going to be more forgiving and, and less interested in who you are. So for me, when I was playing AFL football at the, the height of my uh, fame through football, if you will, I'd be out in Fitzroy. I'd be out in Collingwood. I'd be out in these environments where people didn't care anything about me playing football or what I was doing or how I looked. You know, I've been toying around with getting my nose really pierced for the last few weeks. And I, I just always laugh at Eddie McGuire uh, freaking out one day that I had my nose pierced. Yeah. No one in Fitzroy's ever cared that I had my nose pierced or Northwood or whatever it happened to be. So those environments might be a better environment for you to go out and party with. And the selection of your friends too. Yeah. And I want to be with people that I can trust. So that when I go about my business, whatever my business is, I can do it quietly, I can do it with respect to the environment, respect to myself, and I can have a nice night out. I could list hundreds of useful acts that I miss during the course of my NFL career because I was worried if I go to this, yeah. someone's going to say, hey, I saw Glenn out at 12 o'clock at night on yeah. this night or that night or before a game, when the truth is, I would generally go to bed before a game at 12 o'clock. Yeah. And I'd much rather go to bed with a smile on my face, having gone and seen whoever it happened to be perform, and jumped into bed, slept in, and done my, gone through my routine, which never wavered over the course of 200 odd games. Yeah. I'd much rather do that than try and be in some sort of cocoon at 10 o'clock yeah. at night and worry. But it, it makes common sense that you know, with all due respect to Australia and the world's bikey games, if I'm riding around with a bikey game, I'm going to get lumped in yeah. with that group of people. Yeah. I still might like no bikes, but maybe I need to ride on my own or find some other people to ride with. Yeah. No disrespect to all of yeah. our wonderful yeah. bikey yeah. friends. Yeah. Yeah. But it's just, it, it's, it's just a terrible analogy, but it, I hope it would make sense to our, our viewers that you just got to learn how to be discreet how to go about your business. And, and that discretion is on any number of levels, whether it's physically. All right, someone bumped into me. How am I going to respond to this? Yeah, bang. Oh, oh, well, oh that, that's on camera. Oh, no. Versus, no worries. You know? And so uh, these are mechanisms that are hard for 16, 17, 18, 19 year old men and women to get their heads around, especially if you've got that uh, raging you know, yeah, that testosterone yeah. bursting through your body. Have someone bump into you at a club all of a sudden, it's it's on. Well, maybe you should not have been in that environment on that particular night. And I can think of one young AFL footballer, uh, not Carlton related, who I'm particularly close with. I actually rang his football club. It had to be at least four or five times to have have a word to them because I could see something happening for him. I knew about his personal situation. I could see something happening for him coaching the green back and as a result of that lack of communication or lack of, uh, I, I, honestly I don't think it's lack of respect, 
uh, something did end up happening and it ends up on the news yeah, and there's an issue. Whereas if you had to take a phone call probably six weeks before the actual issue uh, arose publicly, I could have said to him, well, I had this inside information. Uh, I'm sharing it with you because I want the best for this person. I think we need to do a few different things here to protect this person. And the club could have said, hey, we can give you a week away from football, have a little holiday house down the coast that you can yep. use, take your girlfriend, take some friends. If you need to let off some steam, let off some steam down there. Yep. Do need. Hey guys, thanks for sticking around and watching so far. Be sure to tune into part two where Glenn Manson goes in a bit more about his post football career what kept him going and the trials and tribulations it is from going from elite level football to a change of mindset into a city street let us know what you think and until next time see you soon